All right, welcome. My name is Andrew Hedro. I'm a product specialist for Van Dorn. I work in the New York City showroom, although today you're seeing my Brooklyn apartment uh, during these quarantine times. And with me today, I have Sylvan Carton, who works uh, with Van Dorn out at the LA studio. Uh, so Sylvan, welcome and hello. Hi, nice to see you, Andrew. Good to see you too. Um, so I'm gonna ask Sylvan a bunch of questions today and find out a little bit more about him and what he does. and. Honestly, I'm actually very curious about his origin story because I've heard bits and pieces, but I'm, I'm curious to get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Where did you grow up? I grew up in the U.S. and okay. uh, okay. primarily in Georgia. That, okay. that was, uh, but I, I was, I mean, I was born in France to a French family and they moved to the U.S. to Utah when I was 24 days old. And then uh, I spent five years in Utah and Salt Lake City. And then we moved to uh, California, to Los Angeles. Lived there for five years. And then when I was 10, we moved to Georgia. And that's where I went. I was there through high school. Oh, I didn't realize you had previous uh, Southern California experience. Yeah, this is all a big journey to get me back here. <laughs> Very good, okay. Um, so how did you get started in music? Pretty early on, my parents both play music. I grew up with them uh, singing and playing French folk songs. And then, uh, um, so I was like, my dad was playing guitar and my mom was singing along with him. Um, so I got, a, I got a tiny guitar, I think when I was like three or four, I didn't do very much with it. I think I learned one chord. And then when we were going to, we were moving to California, I wrote my first song about going to California. And, uh, that, that didn't really touch music until, um, sixth grade when uh there was you know middle school band and uh, i wanted to be a part of that and i figured i should probably play music since my parents did that and uh they had a flute lying around the house i thought i'd play flute uh, i showed up for the first day of band and saw the saxophones and how much louder they were and how <laughs> that's when i made the switch i think on day one of band from flute to saxophone <laughs> And uh, just because of, mostly because of the volume you can make with the saxophone. <laughs> um, are your parents professional musicians or were they just playing for their own enjoyment? No, they, they just played uh, for their own enjoyment. Like my dad teaches, or he taught French, and then my mom uh, was a translator. Okay. And they, they both have since retired. And now they just play music and, and hang out. <laughs> Sounds great. Work on the house. Right. Um, so here's a question I really wanted to ask you, because uh, knowing you, you play so many different instruments. Obviously, I think we just learned the origin story between saxophone and flute, but I've seen you at various times. You play all the saxophones, and you actually do play all of them. You spend time on all of them. Uh, I've seen you play clarinet. You play guitar. You sing. I'm sure there's other ones. I know you're fairly savvy with recording techniques. I mean, sort of what order did they all come in and how did you get into so many different types of instrument? You know, guitar and saxophone are not that related. Uh, well, like I said, my parents, I saw my dad playing guitar when I was growing up. And then uh, when we moved to Georgia, he, I saw him switch also styles. Uh, he, he had some friends at the university that were into old time Appalachian style music. So he, he switched over and uh, started playing um, some more folk traditional music at around the same time that I started getting into saxophone. Um, so I started, I just saw my parents learning instruments and my mom started playing upright bass, also just to play in that full time group that uh, my parents had. Um, I would mean I was playing saxophone in band because that was the outlet that I had. And then in high school, uh, friends of mine wanted us, they started a band and I really wanted to just be in the band. I didn't care what instrument I was playing. <laughs> And uh, they didn't need a saxophone or a flute. Uh, they needed a guitarist. So I, having seen my parents play guitar and having tried it, I guess when I was three or four, I, oh, I don't remember that experience. Um, I just figured I'd probably play guitar. And so I picked up guitar and had my parents teach me, you know, the, the first song that I needed to learn for to be in the band. And I guess I, guess I started going the guitar route because of uh, wanting to be in a friend's band and a saxophone just to want to be in the high school band. I don't know. There's no real reason, but I was just kind of drawn to both, to anything just to play music with people. Mostly it was to be around people and the people that I liked that were in bands and in band. Yeah, that's, and as far as 
then what instruments the saxophone as as you know requires doubles a lot of the time you're required to play flute and clarinet if you're playing in any sort of big bands so i just picked those up as i had to play them is there one instrument you would consider like you know, I ask a lot of saxophones that may play all four saxophones, but they usually have one, like I really think of myself as an alto saxophone. Is there one instrument, either a saxophone or one of the whatever that you would consider like, that's really what I, my main voice is, that's what I hear the most or if I want to do the most, or are they equal? No, they're not equal. They all have a different place for me. I feel like I'm primarily an alto saxophonist, although the last 10 years I've been playing mostly very sax and clarinet which uh, I definitely do not consider myself a clarinetist, but that's the instrument I've played the most in the last 10 years. And uh, I would like to be a tenor saxophonist. <laughs> and I have a soprano saxophone. <laughs> so, the hardest part is to maintain a certain level on, on each one if you're switching a lot. And I guess a good warm up practice is, is the thing to develop on any instrument. Now, I assume you listen to lots of different types of music. My question is, do you listen to a lot of music that melds the same things you do, like bands that put saxophone with guitars, and, or do you have sort of, I have my saxophone music I like, I have you know, my rock music, do you sort of separate them, or? I sort of separate, I think. I mean, I, I don't know, I, I listen, I like bands like Mr. Bungle, that they do, they go between a lot of different styles, a lot of, um, and. So I'm, I definitely do like that, but also like a lot of more traditional and folk music. I like older music for the most part, like a lot of trad jazz is mm -hmm. that, like that style is nice. Everything all the way up through this like early 60s. Um, after that, things are hit and miss for me. Um, and then uh, a lot of old time Appalachian folk music, bluegrass. Um, mm -hmm. Um, speaking of some stuff you do specifically, I know you worked, I mean, it's very almost trendy now, but I think you were maybe a little ahead of the curve on using electronics with wind instruments. You've been doing pedals for a long time. How did you get yeah. into that? Well, that started with this, the band that I was playing with, Beats Antique. Um, uh, we st I started playing with them 10 years ago and we, uh, I was just playing Barry Sax at first with them and then added clarinet. And then I was playing like on maybe two or three songs a set because they, they play a, like a, it's a gypsy electronic, a, um, a, like a blend of world music and electronic music with live instruments. Um, and the Barry sax and clarinet just, it doesn't need to be on every song. <laughs> it's, so I would play for two or three songs and then I'd be off for like five or six, come back for another song or two. And, I just wanted to play music all night. <laughs> and the best way I could think of doing that is to kind of develop like an electronic sound or like a synth basically without having, and I didn't want to play keyboards or synths. It just didn't, that didn't feel like the right thing to do. And I, I wanted to play clarinet and saxophone just to have a different timbre, a different tone coming out of the instrument and I figured that the best way to do that is to just plug it through instruments or through effect pedals. And, where you can get delays, you can get uh, pitch shifters, harmonizers, and those all kinds of effects with that. Like, as I was mentioning, they didn't have a bass player, so I started playing with a bass octave pedal on my Barry sax. Oh. To actually, and I functioned as the bass player, and I played a lot of sub bass parts um, live, so to make the music a little more organic and less just electronic. Um, so that I essentially I functioned as a bass player for some of the separate, not because it was electronic music we had sometimes we'd have songs where the bass was in there so i could take solos or play clarinet and um they has, they they were the reason i started playing with effects i you would think because i play guitar that it, it's because i was a guitarist but right. as a guitarist i i actually never got into effect pedals i, I had the distortion yes. pedal once and a de delay pedal in college and then those pedals broke and i stopped <laughs> using huh. pedals the only uh, guitar saxophonist that has more pedals for a saxophone than his guitar. Oh yeah, yeah. Way, more, way more for the saxophone. I, I can show you them actually right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, oh man, look at that rig. That's a double rig. It's a double rig, yeah. Very cool. 
And you whole, actually, uh, you have a unique way of, of, I know I've seen some of the, the ways you've, I mean, having a microphone to capture the sound, then put it through the pedals is like the hardest part, right? Because you're dealing especially on a live state of sound. You have a, a couple methods I've seen you do for capturing the sound, right? Well, the, the most effective one that I found is having a microphone inside the instrument. Um, uh, Eddie Harris worked with Selmer and they, they had a, yeah. Um, yeah. a system that was drilled into the neck and they had a microphone uh, plugged in that baritone, the okay. baritone microphone system. And uh, that just makes sense. So you have a very strong signal. All the notes are equally balanced. They're all at the, at, inside the horn, they're all at the same level until you get to the keys where the keys are venting and then all of a sudden every note has a different volume depending on where you're standing. Um, and also inside the horn, you have such a high um, high volume, the, the instrument has such a high volume that other instruments aren't gonna bleed into the microphone. You can keep the microphone at a very low level and the instrument's gonna be picked up. Uh, so miking from the inside is the best way, I, in my opinion, to mic a saxophone. On my berry, I just drilled a hole in the side of the mouthpiece, and that's where the mic goes. Um, um, my next question is regarding, see, just hearing about what you've done, you, you play with different bands, but it sounds like you've traveled a lot, maybe more than even some musicians have. Um, so I just want to ask uh, a couple things about that. First of all, if there, are there any places you really like performing that maybe people wouldn't be aware of around the country or different, different places? Um, well, one of my favorite all-time places was is playing, getting a chance to play at Red Rocks. I, I, that venue is just an amazing venue, and I I had heard about it growing up and heard of all these legendary concerts happening there, and never thought I'd never imagined getting a chance to play there. And the, the first time I went to that venue was actually to, to play there. It was totally awe-inspiring. <laughs> so that would be like on the the top, and otherwise. Outside of that, really, any small, intimate venue—the smaller, the more intimate. The, usually, the more special things. You, that you would prefer that, really like an arena-type concert or something like that. Yes and no. I mean, obviously, I, I'd love to get a chance to play in an arena. But I mean, for you, you, you prefer a more people. intimate setting than a, than like a large concert venue. Say. You, I definitely get different things out of it. Like there, there's something really spectacular about playing in front of a huge crowd. That that's it's, um, but you are also, at the same time, very detached from, from the people you're playing for. So it's, if you're playing for 20,000 people, you can't see them. They're just a crowd. Right. Whereas the three people that are staring you in the eye and watching you and hearing every little breath you're making, it's, 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 that can be nerve wracking, especially if there are fellow musicians in there. Right. <laughs> you're like, okay, you know exactly what I'm doing or not doing. Right. Um, speaking of touring a lot, you are touring with a bunch of equipment, usually in different instruments and large instruments. You tour the baritone a lot. Are there any tricks, tips, or secrets you found, both the travel part and just being on tour that you that you want to share with other musicians? Uh, it depends on the tours, uh, like how you're traveling. Um, like what I recommend generally, trying to establish a routine, trying to have a point in the day where you are doing something for yourself and exercising. I always enjoyed this because of, we were, I was doing a lot of bus tours, so we would drive at night, get to the venue in the morning, and I would have a few hours to relax in the town and before sound check. And during that time, I'd go out get breakfast, go for a nice long walk or do some exercises, and then uh, go and do sound check. Just to have, to try to create, to make the most out of your travels also. Like, mm -hmm. you don't want to just, go to from your vehicle to your venue to your vehicle you want to be able to, I, I personally want to be able to see the town a little bit if I have friends in those towns like connect with them even if it's just briefly to have a cup of coffee or just like say hi at a coffee you know at a park or yep. oh, I was gonna say and then as far as traveling with the berry if you're yep. flying that's just exactly <laughs> that's that requires a nice smile sure and Anything you can do to make it look as small as possible. Right. <laughs> Maybe some photos of it fitting in the overhead, because it does, it can, depending yeah. on your case. Sure. Uh, I wanted to ask, basically, you've lived in California in different parts, and you've spent some time on the West Coast. You've also traveled, and you're familiar with the East Coast. 
um, and also the Southeast and whatever. How would you describe the different music that happens in different places, both from like a genre or from a musical perspective, but also just like equipment wise, I don't know if you've noticed uh, people change the way they actually physically play too. So people have been moving around so much lately that I, I think at this point, I'd, it's safe to say everybody's sort of like, it depends on the genre you're playing and there's, there, that's happening everywhere now. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's as much a coast to coast difference as it is just genre to genre. So you've seen it more homogenized now. I mean, I think 30, 40 years ago was probably more dependent geographically. Yeah, I, at least I, I feel like it because 10 or 15 years ago, I would have said, oh, definitely you got brighter sounds here and like more uh, uh, avant jazz in, in New York. And I think that, that might still be the, the general case, but I've seen so much more of the avant stuff kind of showing its head in LA. Um, in San Francisco, it's kind of San Francisco, New York, I feel like had sort of parallel music uh, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, LA has always been a little bit more on the commercial side, which is sure. uh, part of the reason I moved down here also. Uh, but I, I feel like I've seen a lot more experimental uh, jazz happening in LA in the, in the last 10, 15 years. Well, part of the reason I also decided I could live in LA is I, I started seeing a scene that was more creative. Do you find, obviously you play a ton of instruments that we talked about, but do you find people in LA because there is commercial work still tend to play more doubles or maybe double better or just play more instruments or be more flexible? Is that something you still find? Uh, I I do find that there are a lot of doublers now. That's definitely, a, every, every I'm, I'm so amazed actually at the level of those of the musicianship that they have too. Just the ability to read on so many different instruments at a super high and be able to play at a super high level is really it's impressive to me to, to see the amount of people that are doing that here mm -hmm. and I, it comes because they if somebody gets a call for a gig they don't want to turn it down <laughs> so right. they're gonna and the gig is a recording gig that calls for you know, four saxophones clarinets and one guy <laughs> right. well let's let's uh, get into some maybe some of the van doren specific stuff I'm really curious about this because I have never heard the full story. How did you first get involved with Van Doren? I started working for Van Doren in Paris, in France. I moved to France in 2004 with the goal to just go and be a musician there. And uh, I was, and my girlfriend and I, at the time, we had a, a studio apartment at the Cité Internationale des Arts. And uh, I, I showed up, we showed up in January and I, I found out uh, pretty quickly that or after about a month that, you know, just getting a gig and teaching and all that doesn't really happen as easily. It's not as easy to jump into the workforce in France as it is in the States, where I mean, it's not necessarily easy here, but you want to pick up an odd job, you can do that in the States. Go work at a coffee shop. There, things were a lot harder to do. So I was just going to jam sessions, meeting people and getting some gigs here or there. Um, about a month after about a month of me being there, a friend showed up at a jam session asking if uh, I was still looking for work. And they, he had apparently been by the Van Doren Studios in Paris that day, and they offered him a job. And he was busy in school, so he couldn't take it. Oh, wow. So then I showed up the next day at Van Doren. <laughs> and what did you uh, uh, do when you work? started at, in Paris at the, at the headquarters, at the mothership, as I like to call it? Uh, I did the same. The... I mean, artist relations, product specialist. I spent the, really the first month like learning about all the product and having meetings with some clients. And, but the first month was really focused on uh, every day I would just get different sets of mouthpieces and reads and play them. And uh, Lohan would help me through that. We'd do uh, blindfold tests and just really get developing my ear to and language as far as like describing sound so that you know, I knew how to talk about uh, the sound and how to then also what reads and mouthpieces would and combinations of would kind of help people get those sounds wow, okay. um and then yeah then it was just the same thing that uh, we both do we're just meeting clients and helping them find the right sound and the right feel for their setups um and what what would you say the majority of the people you see at the la studio are they teachers players or do you get a just mix of everything we get a mix of everything i mean a lot of 
players and who are also teachers. I mean, that's they're, they're a bit of both. And then uh, the ones that are college, a lot of college professors will bring in uh, their studios. So we'll have like a day where there'll be 10 saxophonists in there and the, 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 the prof will come in. Everybody will try to find something that works for them. You also, so you, you do product specialist work like I do, obviously letting people try stuff and making equipment recommendations, but you also work in the artist relations side of things. So I just wonder if you could touch on what exactly it is you do there and how the artist program sort of works uh, for Van Dorn in the United States. Um, well, uh, mostly it's an interfacing with the, the artists. Like I, I'm the voice of the company and I'm, I try to make sure that uh, our artists are taken care of as much as we can take care of them. Um, if they if they're happy with their setups, that's great. I just need to make sure that they get that they're getting everything and they need. If they need support for clinics or master classes that they're doing, we, I try to um, you know, funnel them to the right channels for that. Uh, if um, sometimes the artists are in town, they just they need uh, some supplies. That that's an easy just come over, come by the studio. That's more but that's an easy job to do. If artists are like we have somebody who's not quite happy with their setup or maybe they've been playing on it for a long time and it's worn down and they need to find something new or their taste has changed or they're looking to try different things mm -hmm. really same thing that we do at the studio just, just meet with them try to see what's working what's not try different reads try different out pieces and um help them through that it's a little bit but i was wondering if there's any particular or any couple maybe highlights of having worked for van dorn over the years because you've been doing this for some time now is anything that stands out to you but just to be able to be in a practice room with, it's a Boris Alagradian and having him play stuff and like giving him mouthpieces and reads to try and, and talking about sound with him and is, and with all the other people of, of his level, da David Howard comes in and plays bass clarinet and I'm, I'm listening to him. At, it's like I'm getting private lessons with these right. amazing musicians mm -hmm. and, and they're asking me questions. <laughs> and, and seeking my advice on, on you know, so, so that's, uh, to me, that is, that's uh, the highlight, is being able to do that and being able to be a part of that scene. All right. I guess the uh, the last thing I'd want to ask you is, uh, what Van Dorn wine is your favorite Van Dorn wine? I'm going to go with Rosé. Rosé. Very good choice. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else you want to add? Um, no, I'm, uh, I'm content. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, Sylvan Carton. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And thank you all for checking out this interview with our West Coast representation of Van Dorn. Thank you, Andrew. Take care.